and welcome to another Chai Tutors video. In today's video, we're going to be unpacking the poem Go Lovely Rose by Edmund Waller. So a little bit of information about our poet. This is always important so we can understand the um, poem and its message in context. Edmund Waller was born in 1606 and he died in 1687. He was an English poet and he was a member of parliament from quite a young age. He was involved in a conspiracy and eventually exiled after avoiding the death sentence. So if you're interested in an interesting historical story, I would definitely advise that you read up on this on this man. And he is known for writing lyric poems. So they're filled with emotion and musicality and Go Lovely Rose is one of his more famous ones. And it definitely includes that emotion and musicality. Go Lovely Rose Tallow that wastes her time in me, that now she knows when I resemble her to be, how sweet and fair she seems to be. So before we even get into it, let's talk a little bit about context or a little bit about what we're dealing with in this poem. So firstly, the symbol of the rose is very important in this poem. A rose represents love, beauty and romance, but we also know that roses can represent, represent fragility because they will die. Um, they are mortal and they are going to die quite quickly after you, you harvest them. And this is going to show this, this theme of running out of time. So in this poem, the speaker is talking to this rose and because he's sending this rose to this woman who has seemingly rejected his advances in the past and who he really wants to be with. So he's sending this rose as a gift, but also to send a message to the speaker no to the to the um to the recipient the speaker is sending the message to the recipient or to this woman that he admires and he wants to be with um and he's going to basically give the rose instructions in every single stanza on what it should be saying to the to the woman that he's interested in and so every single stanza he's going to highlight a different aspect of the rose and he's going to draw comparisons between the rose and the woman that he desires and he hopes that through this gift of the rose that the woman will be convinced to go out with him. So it's a bit of an old-fashioned idea of courtship um, so just keep that in mind so it is slightly different to what we would expect these days I would say. So go lovely rose we start off that first line a repetition of the title and he is starting with the verb, actually the first two lines he starts with the verbs. He's giving this commanding instruction, he's demanding of the rose. Um, and he uses something called apostrophe. This is a figure of speech apostrophe. Apostrophe is when you address an inanimate object as though it is um, a human being, right? So he's talking to the rose as though he's talking to a human being. There is personification in there as well because it's giving the rose the ability to communicate. Through this apostrophe, he's basically giving us the impression that the rose is, has the ability to communicate and to speak all these different things. Um, and so through this apostrophe, he's giving, he's emphasizing the rose's power, which he hopes that the rose is going to have this power to persuade this woman to be with him. Tell her that wastes her time in me. He says, this rose must go and tell this woman that she is wasting her time and she's also wasting my time. That now she knows, here we have alliteration there, so that adds to the lyrical nature of this poem. When I resemble her to be, so when I compare, she's going to see the comparison between the rose and herself. So there we have the metaphor, the rose is being compared to the woman, or the woman is being compared to the rose. How sweet and fair she seems to be. Sweet and fair, we're going to see that repeated later on. He thinks that she is beautiful, and um, he wants to be with her, but this she seems to be... Perhaps the speaker references here that he doesn't know the woman all too well. Um, maybe she he thinks she's sweet and fair, but pleads with her to stop wasting both of their time so that they can get to know each other more. Um, notice the assonance, sweet and seems. That's also creating a sort of lyrical and musical effect. So in this stanza, um, and we're going to break down per stanza why the speaker thinks that the woman should be with him. Stanza one, because of her beauty. She's very beautiful. She should not waste her time and she should not waste his time and she should be with the speaker. Stanza two. Tell her that's young and shuns to have her graces spied. That hadst thou sprung in deserts where no men abide, thou must have uncommended died. 
So over here, he is going to once again command the rose. You can see tell he is demanding the rose and the woman that he is sending the rose to. Um, and he, he uses this anecdote or this imagery or this little story where he says, imagine that you have this rose that has, like this rose that I'm presenting you, it has sprung up in the middle of the desert, but there's no one to actually watch it or to notice or appreciate this rose's beauty. And he says, well, then this rose is just going to uncommended die. It's just going to die and appreciate it. Does her beauty even exist? So shunned means persistently ignored. To have her grace spied means to have her beauty observed. So if someone is going to consistently reject to have their beauty appreciated, and this is a representation of the speaker's perspective of beauty, um, he says it's like this beautiful rose that sprang up in the desert no men, where no men abide, meaning where no people are present to see it. And so it has died uncommended, has died without receiving any praise. So this anecdote of the beautiful flowers spring up in the empty or isolated desert with no one to witness or admire the beauty. The speaker relates that her beauty is wasted if no men are around it to appreciate it. So he says, if you don't have your beauty appreciated, then it's like it doesn't even exist at all. Then it's uncommended died. It's nothing. So the second stanza, what's his reasoning for the fact that the woman should be with him? Well, that she's very beautiful. But if her beauty does not go appreciated, then, you know, is it really beauty at all? Small is the worth of beauty from the light retired. Bid her come forth, suffer herself to be desired, and not blush so to be admired. In this stanza, the speaker is saying that, he should be, that the woman should be with him because um, she should be proud of her beauty. So going off from the previous stanza, he's like, if your beauty is not appreciated, then sort of what's the point? He says, rather, you should be proud of your beauty. So he says, beauty is nothing unless it's, if it's appreciated. And to him, being appreciated means that it's in the spotlight, that it's admired by men. He says, bid her come forth. So now he goes sort of back to his mission, uses the verb again. He's like being commanding. Um, so he tells the rose to make the woman come forward suffer herself to be desired so at first he says she might suffer she may struggle with this idea that she should be desired but she must just accept it you know suffer herself to be desired it may be a challenge at first but then she must get over it and she must accept being desired this is what the speaker is saying and not blush so to be admired he says she should not um, be ashamed of her beauty she should bask and be proud she should bask in the compliments and be proud of her beauty um, not recede from it Then the last stanza where he gets even more dramatic he says then die that she the common fate of all things rare may read in thee how small a part of time they share that are so wondrous sweet and fair so in this stanza he is going to basically communicate this idea that beauty has a shelf life and he says the final reason why the um, woman should be with him is because you are going to lose all your beauty soon You'll die like everything else, but also your beauty will die, your beauty will fade. So sort of seize the moment and be with me now while your beauty is still long lasting. Then die. This is the instruction to the rose and to the woman, perhaps the potential lover. Um, and he tells the rose to die. And we have this exclamation mark in the middle of the line. So that's an example of Sijura when there's this very dramatic pause in the middle of a line. And that exclamation mark indicates the demanding nature and the frustrated tone of the speaker. Notice the enjambment in the first two lines, that she, the common fate of all things rare. And this enjambment, the run-on lines, emphasizes how time is passing, right? The clock is ticking, your beauty is fading. The common fate of all things rare. This is such a wonderful line, I think, because there's a little bit of a contradiction because he's talking about common and then rare. But what he means, this is like the fundamental message of the poem is he says, all beautiful things die. So he hopes that when the woman sees the rose die, she will understand the mortality of her own beauty and will be motivated to seek the speaker. May read in thee, meaning that hopefully when she sees you die, when she sees the rose die, she's going to come to terms with this idea and she's going to um, figure out that she needs to make the best of the beauty while she has it. And then the last two lines, it's sort of this general statement where he sums everything up. He says, how small a part of time they share that are so wondrous, sweet and fair. So he talks about the qualities of roses and the qualities of the women's beauty. He says, you have limited time to experience their beauty. 
and you see sweet and fair repeated from the first stanza, so the sort of cohesion to the piece. So in terms of the structure, we have a rhyme scheme, A, B, A, B, B. We have a regular rhythm, the lines alternate, we have short and long lines, all the short lines rhyme, and then the long lines rhyme together. There's a lot of use of imperatives as well, where he's being very commanding and demanding. The structured nature of the poem emphasizes that the speaker is making a calculated argument. It is a lyric poem, but he is making this argument to the, it's very well thought out. It's not just a typical love poem in the sense of, you know, if you think of some love poems, which is just free verse, where he's just like expressing his love. No, he's making a calculated argument as to why this woman should be with him. And so therefore we have a very structured, um, the structure is quite structured and precise and calculated. The um, theme and the message, seize the day, or you can call it carpe diem, seize the day. Obsession, infatuation and lust, time and mortality, how beauty should be celebrated and how it is mortal, that it does fade. And physical beauty is also very much a key theme. The mood is quite passionate. The tone is brazen, blunt, assertive, confident, frustrated. And the last stanza a little bit threatening. So depending on where you are, what lines you are referencing, you can use different words to really unpack that. Um, it's de definitely a one-sided poem in the sense that we don't know what the woman's all about or, you know, we don't know much history, but all we know is that the speaker is sending this message of the rose in an attempt to convince the woman to be with him. We don't know if he's successful or not with this strategy. I hope that you found that video helpful in terms of your understanding of the poem. Um, please remember to watch my video on how to unpack Sing poetry questions and I even have a video on IB paper one just going through all of the different techniques or all the different strategies I would advise when you're attempting a three hour paper. Please like this video and subscribe to the channel and I'll see you in the next one.